COVID, navigating the new normal. We've got a number of speakers here with us uh, today. Really looking forward to hearing all you have to share. Let me go through my notes, otherwise I will forget things. COVID cleaning, we do ask that as you walk in and as you walk out, you clean your hands as stations can do so. Uh, we don't need to track who's been here, so you can remain anonymous. You don't need to know all the nefarious things you've done or places you've been. Uh, but I will let you know uh, that if you head out through the corridor and go down, uh, that there's ladies' toilets on the left, guys' toilets on the right. Um, there is also tea and coffee there. Uh, we're not going to be uh, studious. You can, you can go out and grab yourself a tea and coffee whenever you like. It's self-serve anyway. I'm sorry we can't offer you Tim Tams again. Why COVID? Um, we have... Uh, a total of 10 speakers, so for us to have any opportunity to get through tonight in any way, shape or form, uh, we are asking them to keep to five minutes. Now, I've automated it so that at the five minute mark, a bit of sound starts. And there's a minute of sound until it gets quite loud and you will get booed off the stage, okay? I love you and we want to hear as much from you as we can. You've got five minutes to do the best you can with five minutes. Each speaker, uh, if you can, um, there's a little bit of hand sanitizer here. If you can just clean your hands before you grab the mic, because the mic's going to be shared, and then uh, that way we're at least trying to cover that as best as we can. Before we go any further, I've got two minutes and 46 seconds before the next speaker. Uh, we're going to pray. We're going to stop and pray. And so if you will just bow your heads with me, uh, we're going to just commit this time together to the Lord. Lord, as we begin, we want to just thank you that in this building right now, we have different people from different walks of life, different congregations, different denominations, and we gather around the name of Jesus. That there is unity in this place. There is a shared goal and hope for tonight that collectively we can discern and learn a little bit more of the will of God through this season. So I want to begin in prayer in this time Holy Spirit, would you move in this place? I pray against any critical, cynical minds that we could have. Oh, if we did it at our church, it would have been this way, it would have been better. Lord, we ask that there would be humility. The kind of humility that breeds unity. Holy Spirit, would you gather your people together as Jesus prayed for us to be one as the Father and Son are one. May there be this unity. As well, Lord, we do pray for each of our speakers. Would they speak as best as they can within the time limit forced upon them? It's cruel and unusual punishment. But we ask that you may give them each word dripping with biblical, reflective, impacting language that would be useful for your church and for your people. And so, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, together as one people, we say, Amen. Amen. Okay, the first speaker is uh, Paul Quick, aka my dad. Uh, so I hope that you enjoy him. He's going to be speaking on the power of the second question. So uh, you've got your microphone here. If you can clean your hands before you pick it up. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Hello everybody, this is, uh, I'm not working, so I'll turn it on. And now, we'll work, there you go. I think this is an exceptional initiative uh, on a number of points. Uh, one, to be able to gather <coughs> Christian uh, ministers, pastors, workers uh, together uh, for unity is brilliant. But secondly, it is, I think it's an excellent initiative because you are gleaning lessons learned from um, precedent time. So uh, well done. Won't be the first time I borrow an idea of my son and implement it back up in the big smoke. So I am from Morley Baptist and Ray asked me if I could come down and share some things. So um, I want to talk about, as Ryan mentioned, the power of the second question. And let me just tell you 
um, where this training came from. Oh, if I move, you. No, I, got a, I, I can move. You can move to where the white dot is. Okay. Any other instructions? Other than that, we do this a lot. Let me just tell you uh, some of where this training came from. Uh, we have an exceptionally good pastoral care lady at Morley Baptist, and her and I have been catching up together uh, on a sort of weekly basis since I started there in July last year and just checking who's been at church, who hasn't, who needs follow-up. Um, we took the initiative at the start of this year in February to say we should expand this team and actually just invite some other pastoral care people and create a team. And so I think we had uh, six or seven of us, February the 2nd, and we just started the pastoral care team. I gave them a little bit of parameters about what was involved, when they refer up, if it's complex, and we just got started, just catching up with different people as they felt led. That was February. All of a sudden, by the end of March, COVID hit, and by the providence of God, we already had a pastoral care team in place. So as soon as we went into lockdown, uh, Judy, the pastoral care lady, and I just said, let's just get our pastoral care team rotating through the whole church directory uh, and they'll just start visiting or call, not visiting calling uh, three people a week each so that through the whole season into the valley by the time we came back out we had gone through the whole church directory twice over and i just look at that and think oh god you knew what you were doing uh, we didn't know when we called that group together in february that we would hit this sort of a time uh, there you go, we had this group of pastoral care folk who were uh, just willing to make contact with people. So this is some of the training that I gave that team. And I want to present it to you. Um, some of it will be old hat for you, I'm sure. I'm speaking to some seasoned people. But what I'd like you to notice and uh, pay attention to as we go through some of these passages is what do you see God seeking to do through the questions? And what do you notice happening in humans as he asks the question? Okay, this is going to be quick, but let's do it. Firstly, um, Genesis 3. So this is the first time I see God asking two questions, bang, bang. And uh, you know the story well. Uh, so they've just taken the fruit, and God comes walking in the cool of the evening. They've heard him coming. They've gone off and hid. Great idea. Yeah, let's hide from the Almighty. Yeah, you won't see that. <laughs> Fantastic. God asked the question. He called to the man. He said to him, where are you? Singular, apparently, in the Hebrew. Where are you? What's God trying to do through this question? Uh, and he said, now notice this. This is so informative. I think every time you see something, page one to three in the Bible, it actually sets up something of a pattern that you'll keep seeing recurring. Um, so the, the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself so God asked the second question who told you that you were naked opportunity for Adam to say have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat opportunity for Adam to say yes but what does he do instead it's your fault God you gave me the woman it's the woman you gave me you know but here's an example of God asking not just one question, but the second question. Why is God doing that? And what's going on in the human as that second question comes? Uh, it doesn't take long before there's another example. I'm going to give you five, one, two, three, six, very quickly. Here's the second one. And this time it's with Cain and Abel. And you know the story once again. Abel, uh, keeper of flocks, Cain. Uh, were to produce from the ground. They gave their offerings. God was pleased with Abel's, not so with Cain. Cain gets angry. So God asks the first question. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Great question asking why. Why are you angry and why is your face fallen? Uh, Cain doesn't reply. He just takes his brother out to the field. He kills him. And so God asks the second question. Verse 9, the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? What have you done? Um, again, it's an opportunity for confession. Uh, here's uh, two more from the Old Testament before we do a couple of New Testament ones. Um, Elijah, great story. He's just had that wonderful victory on Mount Carmel. 
He flees because Jezebel uh, threatens him. He goes in the strength of that angelically provided food, 40 days, 40 nights. He gets to a cave on Mount Sinai, Horeb, and uh, God asks him the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? He has a prescriptive answer. Oh, I've been very jealous for Yahweh and you know everybody's really bad and I'm the only one left. God shows up in an earthquake, fire, still voice, and then God says it again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Isn't that interesting that God asks the same question twice? That's not random. God's always deliberate in his questions. Why do you do that? And Elijah gives exactly the same answer second time round. That something's going on. Last one from the Old Testament. Um, cracker of a story, isn't it? Jonah. And you know, you know this scene in chapter 4. He is spitting chips with God because God didn't smite those blighters and Ninevites like he wanted God to. And so he's sitting out there on the east side of the city waiting to see what's going to happen. And God comes to Jonah and says, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah? And he doesn't reply doesn't say anything. He just goes and sits down, he makes a bit of a booth, and, you know, a plant grows up, gives him some shade, then God sends a worm that kills the plant, then God sends a strong east wind. Jonah is even angrier, like he is just ropeable. And then God comes again and says, do you do well to be angry for the plant? At this time Jonah does reply, yes I do do well, you know, angry enough to die. <laughs> and it's like God saying, great, now we're getting somewhere. Now you're letting me know what's going on inside of you. Fantastic. So four examples from Old Testament. Here's two just quickly from New Testament. Again, what are you noticing God do? And what are you noticing going on inside people? Um, I love the way Jesus did this with his, with his disciples when he went on a road trip. And so he takes them up Caesarea Philippi and he just drops a pop question. Who do people say that I am? Notice the direction that these questions go. Starts general, it's personal. Who do people say? Hey, what's the what's the uh, what's the goss? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they give the popular answers, and then he puts them on the spot and say, "But what about you? Who do you say that I am?" Second question: Why does he do the second question? One last example. Um, Luke twenty-four, uh, again, uh, such a preachable passage, isn't it? That uh, here's these two club has. And are we given the other person down? I don't think we are. Uh, but they're walking those eight miles or so uh, from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And the stranger comes along. And he just sort of incognito, risen Jesus, just sort of sidles up on the side, walks on with them. And he says to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? They stood still and say, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who hasn't heard the things that have happened? He asks the second question and says, what things? And all of a sudden, it comes out. What's well, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth? We had hoped. And it's like, ah. So, what do you notice? What is God doing with the second question? What's going on in the humans? Why don't you talk together for 30 seconds? By the second question, what's going on in the humans? Okay, bring it back. Drop somebody in. What was the great answer you heard? What do you reckon? Hands up, Joss. I know you've got something. <laughs> the first question was a general. Yep. Question. The second one was more probing and more um, looking for a personal response. Great, great. Anything else? Yeah, like he's giving us the space. He's giving us space. Excellent insight. He's giving us space. Isn't that interesting? God would do that. Yes. But he already knows the answer. So but he already knows the answer. <laughs> so why? So why is he doing it? So the person admits what's inside. Okay, so it's providing opportunity for the human. Yeah, to come out. Yeah, um, he's doing it. I believe, anyway, um, to draw us out. Yes. To know what the problem is, and that can be dealt with then. Right. So in the drawing out, when the problem comes to the surface, then what's 
What's available then? Vulnerability. Vulner it is vulnerability, and in the midst of vulnerability, there can be healing, there can be grace. Now, why do we need to have the second question? Because I think when we watch what God does, it informs us about our pastoral practice. Because you know what it's like. I do it too, right? How's your week been? I am not so bad. And you know, as soon as they say that, oh no, there's a story, and you've got a decision to make right there. You know what I'm talking about? And you go, do I have the energy or the time to ask the second question? And sometimes we don't. But you know that people don't always come out with everything right up front. How was your week? Oh, you're not all that bad. Oh, that didn't sound too persuasive. Tell me more. And all of a sudden, the second question how it comes. Yeah? yeah? Sometimes, too, it's because um, page three star, Adam, we will have the, we, our response to the first question will be just a presenting issue. I'm angry. Oh, I'm, I'm hiding. And it takes the second question to get down to the underlying issue. Why are you angry, Jonah? Oh, because I don't like you being who you are to people that I don't want you to be like that to. You know? The power of a second question. So uh, when I did this training with um, a, a pastoral care team, there's a limit, of course, isn't there? Don't keep battering people with questions. <laughs> okay. But uh, with the pastoral care team, it was really good just to tease some of this stuff out. So here's a group of lay folk, and I was going to train them in some pastoral skills of being attentive enough. Uh, now Agatha Christie, oh, I'm showing my age here, apologies. <coughs> Agatha Christie's uh, character, Miss Markle, was an acute observer of the human condition. I think as pastors we could take a leaf out of that book. Notice the tone in the voice. Notice where the eyes dart. Notice if the fists clench. Notice the tremor when they respond and pick it up. So I noticed when you answered Justine, there was a sense of fear at school. Yeah? And then you can bring something out to the surface. The power of the second question. We really enjoyed that. I've gone over time. I uh, hope that's a blessing. I am looking forward to hearing uh, the lessons that you're going to be sharing with each other tonight. And over to... Over to Ross. Thank you. Can we give uh, Paul a round of applause? If you're interested in, in any more on that, grab him after the time together. Um, Ross is, is getting ready, <laughs> doing well. Sort of like uh, eating TEDx, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Gary, I'll just point over that way. Beautiful. Yeah. I've expanded my, my question a little. It was mental, uh, care for mental health post-COVID, but I've been included COVID and post-COVID because I don't think we're actually out of it just yet. Um, and possibly we'll be back into it. But anyway, we'll find out what happens next. Um, we can have a reasonable I idea. Is that working? The big middle one? Big middle one? Gary, maybe I should yeah. just give you a, a nod. I'll give you a wave. How's that? Yeah. Um, we can have a reasonable idea what might happen post-2020 um, because we have been in a similar situation before. Um, thanks, Gary. In the GFC, which you'll remember from 2008, 2009, uh, millions of people in both the US and Europe developed health and mental health issues following that situation. Similarly, the novel coronavirus outbreak, pandemic, has increased the general level of anxiety throughout the population and has also increased people's fear of other people. Thanks, Gary. As well as many people being apprehensive about the negative financial repercussions of time off work and global recession, we also worry about our own health and the health of vulnerable members of our society. Um, so in this environment of fear, uncertainty, suspicion and anxiety, many people, and this is a key thing, many people feel helpless and distrustful. They feel they cannot alter the situation. During such times when we actually and naturally 
<coughs> desire to be close to others to help assuage our, our fear and uncertainty. Practices such as social distancing and isolation can cause a significant psycho psychological toll. Uh, Self-quarantine can trigger fe feelings of boredom, uh, loneliness, anger, depression, and even suicidal thoughts. And there can be increased tensions in the home, heightening the possibility of domestic violence and abuse. Among the elderly, social isolation brings a higher, higher likelihood of medical risks because the psychological risk of loneliness and depression decreases one's ability to fight infection and inflammation. So conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, asthma, and others disorders can be either uh, instigated or elicited or exasperated. So, thanks Gary. Along with increasing stress, there's the increased likelihood of some people attempting to quench the psychological pain they're feeling with increased use of alcohol or opiates or other drugs or other addic addictive uh, behaviours. As we all know, stress can also lead to sleep disorders and disturbances and a reduced ability to feel pleasure from activities that would normally give us pleasure. Thanks, Gary. Furthermore, people stuck at home are spending far more time in front of the screen. Children who are distance learning are doing more schoolwork on computers, uh, checking the news, which can also heighten people's sense of apprehension and fear, um, because, particularly, well, they're all propaganda, particularly commercial TV stations sell fear. They, they sell that anxiety um, to keep the people hooked into watching. Uh, so there's been watching shows and Netflix and video gaming, even Zooming with loved ones, all increase exposure to screens. And as you may already be aware, exposure to screens means increased exposure to blue light shifted light. Now, the myelin in our bodies responds to blue light shifted light because that triggers our body to say, okay, morning light is blue light shifted. It triggers our body to say, oh, the, the day is breaking. It's time to get up and get ready to get going. Um, and in the evening, the natural light is red shifted. That tells us time to go sleepy bye byes. So if you're bombarding your retinas with blue light shifted light late at night, then you're getting mixed messages. Your body's getting the message, it's time to wake up and get going. And part of you is saying, but it's 10 o'clock, I've got to go to bed. So that disrupts sleep. Um, thanks, Gary. So how do we combat all this? Look, we are fantastically integrated beings. And interestingly, the key to good mental health are primarily physical and practical disciplines. So here's the first one. Thanks, Gary. Nurture your spirituality and practice self-compassion. So daily prayer, Bible reading, connecting with nature, journaling, can all be helpful in staying grounded and finding a source of strength and hope. Now, being self-compassionate has definite beneficial health outcomes. Uh, for some people, they may think, well, being kind to myself and understanding to myself, that's sort of selfish, isn't it? Um, but that's not the case. What we find is giving activates the reward system in the brain. And when we are able to be kind to ourselves, we also strengthen our ability to be compassionate towards other people as well. So, as the good master said, we love others as we love ourselves. Same as you use, okay? Thanks, Gary. Stay connected and increase emotional intimacy. Look, social activity is linked to positive mental health. So when meeting restrictions are in place, we need to create alternate solutions to that. Alternate communities are facilitated by technology, online book clubs, blogs, talk radio, call-in programs, online chats, study programs, they're all readily available. Plus, we can connect to people by the usual mechanisms of phone and text and uh, video chat. Thanks, Gary. Aerobic exercise is particularly effective as a stress reduction tactic. It releases endorphins, it combats inflammation, which is always a comorbid thing with so many other uh, diseases that we face. Um, so just the left-right motion that you make when you're, uh, you know, walking, running, exercising, 
helps regulate the left-right hemispheres of your brain. Uh, if you exercise in a green environment, in a park or around trees, uh, that actually helps still ruminating thoughts. It quietens your thinking. If you can exercise by a body of water, the estuary or the ocean or a river, there's higher ionised air. As you know, if you buy a commercial air ionizer, it helps clear the mind, it helps you clear thinking, uh, clear your thinking. So that's really beneficial. Um, look, I stressed reading this morning, there's a university in Vermont, uh, the Vermont, Vermont Medical Centre, yeah. who did a program with 100 inpatients who were suffering moderate to severe depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, or suicidal ideation. They put them into a three time a week, one hour exercise program. 97.6% of them had positive outcomes just from exercising. The report went on to say that exercise is now fully integrated in their program because it is as effective as pharmacological intervention. That is significant. You, when I'm seeing clients, I, I ask them three main questions. How are you eating? How are you sleeping? How are you exercising? Three primary self-care questions. Uh, thanks, Gary. Ross, I yeah. think we might need to close up on that point. Okay. No, it's, a, it's great, isn't it? It's yeah. really good to hear from. Um, so, how about 30 seconds? 30 seconds. Okay, let me run through this. Gary, just look at the headings. Uh, laugh, laugh, laughter is great for stress. Sleep, sleep's really good. Uh, sunlight. Um, sunlight helps regulate the, the sleep program. Um, eating well. Thanks, Gary. The last one is the bigger picture. It's also helped to understand that what we're going through right now, if you're in a place of stress, is only part of it. Um, I sometimes get the, the client to put a bit of paper, write all their stuff on the bits of paper, all the exercise, all the things they're troubling, hold them up to your nose like this, you know. Now can you cook dinner, talk to a friend, have coffee, uh, watch a movie, no you can't. Okay, move it away. Now can, well I can a bit, not very. Really. Okay, push it away like this, can, well mostly. Okay, leave your arms up like that in 30 seconds, a minute, it's gonna get really hard. Okay, now just lay it down in your lap. Now can you talk to a friend, have a coffee, cook dinner, watch a movie, yeah. Well, hey, this stuff is still all here. It's just that before you were fused to it, it was filling your whole vision. So part of it is recognizing what you're going on, what's going on for them is just part of their story, it's not the whole story. Thank you. Well done. Let's give them a round of applause. Well, uh, David, I think due to PowerPoint issues or whatever it is, you're you were second, now you're third. But you know, that's fine. That's fine. I'll do this quickly. Oh, I'm into my time. Cool. Hi folks, I truly believe God goes before us and prepares a way. Uh, in January all our chaplains met at formation and were given a daily devotion for the year. Come the end of March when we're in the middle of the pandemic and I'm sitting at my desk panicking a little bit, um, the daily devotion was this. It was about Boaz taking Ruth for his wife. We say that God can interrupt us any time he wants. We just don't expect him to do it. <laughs> Ruth never expected God to interrupt her the way he did. New home, new work, new husband, new baby. Wonderful additions to her family, but certainly calls for life adjustments. Are you truly ready to say, Lord, interrupt me any way you want? And then the prayer was, interrupter of routine, Prepare me for new relationships, new work, new hope. I want to escape from the dullness of routine. But I crave its security. Let me find security in you. Interrupt my life. Amen. So that devotion put me back on track. Some opportunities for youth care during the COVID crisis. A lot of our chaplains reported stronger relationships with staff. We know that the school chaplains are there for students, staff and parents, but certainly the support and the relationship building with staff increased. 
uh, the chaplains were given a small one-off budget to honour their senior school staff who were under pressure. Uh, chaplains use that money for coffees, for cakes, flowers, that sort of stuff. So that was an opportunity to build relationships with senior staff. Youth care senior management were invited to meet with DOE senior management in working a way forward. Uh, that was a good opportunity for youth care to be working in that space. Um, some challenges. I had to take a bloke to Corrigan for a chaplaincy interview. We had to fill in paperwork and cross boundaries. I'm really disappointed to say I never saw a police car until on the way back when I was going past the Waterloo service station. Um, our main challenge was setting up processes for maintaining service. Um, we were really big on a continuation of service in the schools. Fortunately, the schools didn't close down, so there was always people working at the schools, and that meant the chaplains maintained their presence at the schools. Um, we set up video meetings, and then we discovered cases from Perth where students were recording video meetings, all altering them and then putting them online. So we stepped back from that space. Um, another uh, challenge was our cancelling of our fundraising events. Some things that we hope to continue into the future post-COVID. Uh, we have 20 area chaplains that work around the state. Each fortnight we start our Monday morning for an hour online um, praying, encouraging and supporting each other. So that's one good thing that's come out of it. The Minister for Education sent a letter through to all chaplains, Sue Ellery, and part of that letter says, on behalf of the McGowan Government, thank you for being flexible. Thank you for changing the way you do things to keep yourself and your school community safe and then changing again and again as the situation needed it. Thanks for going above and beyond for working harder and longer than ever before for supporting those who needed it and for getting through this. Thank you. The work you do is truly valued. Just want to finish off because I've got 50 seconds. I'm going to go under time. Yay. Um, I, sent, I felt like I sent emails galore out to the chaplains and one little bit of email that I sent out to them was this. Change and challenges are great opportunities. This is an opportunity for us to connect and build relationships with staff and parent community. This is our opportunity to get to know new people. This is our opportunity to grow and discover new and exciting ways of providing support to others. This is our opportunity to bring calm and hope and encouragement. This is our opportunity to show how to live by faith and not by fear. Let us glorify our God in all we do and say. Remember we are called to be a non-anxious presence in an anxious world. And if you write one thing down from my speech, let it be that. Be a non-anxious presence in an anxious world. Thank you. I think, Tim, sorry, you may be jumping the gun, but that's okay. You can go, you can go one first. Danielle, that means you have to be next. I'm sorry, you've got to be flexible. No, uh, it's okay. Would you like to go next? Go on, Danielle. I'd like I get a five minute reprieve. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've, got, you've got 50 seconds before you're meant to be there. So you've got time. Done well. Sorry, Dan. social services stated it clearly when they said that the devastation of COVID-19 has confronted us all with a serious weakness in our social protection systems. So globally and domestically, people living without a safe place, which is far too many people, have been shown to be at far greater risk of all the multiple effects of the COVID pandemic, that is health, social and economic. Now, Australia is a wealthy country but one in eight people here actually live in poverty. So for some of us here, we need to acknowledge 
that we are not able to stay safe and stable at home because of our privilege. Privilege is something that can be invisible, invisible if you're the one that has it, but for the one in eight that don't in Australia, it is painfully visible. So, using my own life as an example, I sometimes think I'm not very privileged. I'm single, I live alone, I study far too much, but I have education, that's a really big privilege. I have technology, so when I was isolated, I wasn't really in my family in Perth, but I talked to them every day. I kind of saw some of my friends because I had a social bubble of one person to see. <laughs> um, I get paid old study, which is fantastic. And it's been increased lately because I used to live under the poverty line, but right now I'm just above it. <laughs> <laughs> because of my church and family community, I never lack food, I never lack shelter. And because of my education, I have part-time work that is safe and secure. I'm also privileged because of my education. I know about mental health. All those things you were saying, I know to exercise, I know to spend time with God, I know to talk to my family, I know to craft and to sew and to read and to not just live in my study books all the time, even though my lecturers would be far more happy if I did. <laughs> so even though I've managed frustrating things, being single, having some health conditions, my neurology appointment, which I really need because I have vertigo all the time, <laughs> has been delayed, but I have so many things to be grateful for. And that's my reflection on COVID-19. So I mentioned before that 13.6 of the population, or one in eight, currently live below the poverty line. Think about you, think about your blessings and your position. Has COVID-19 been hard? Has it really been that hard, if you think about where you are? So that was at the beginning of the year, that one in eight. By June, an additional 549,000 people have become unemployed. Our unemployment rate doubled from five to 10%. 66% of those unemployed households are those one in eight living in poverty. Rent assistance is still $78 a week when the median house price is 440. 44% of children in sole parent households live in poverty and 37% of single mums live in poverty. The poverty gap, so that gap between what a lot of people earn and what people in poverty earn, $282 a week difference. Now throw in the global pandemic and consider how that's become worse. So with my last one minute, I'm going to jump into why should you care about this? Micah 6 verse 8, God called us to do what is right, to love mercy and to live humbly with your God. In Proverbs, he says, who, he who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honours God. In Proverbs 22, 9, if you're kind to the poor, if you're someone who is blessed and you're kind to the poor, you'll be rewarded for what you have done. In Deuteronomy, we have an actual command. If among you, one of your brothers should become poor, one of your community, someone in Australia, your land, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. We get to live in this wonderful, wealthy nation. Haven't even talked about the rest of the world that are still experiencing COVID. We're post-COVID here, maybe a little bit, but the rest of the world, the other side of Australia, they're not. All right, so the point was to just share this reflection ask you to think about that. As we think about emerging as ourselves, ask what the church and society can do about poverty. I wear another hat as a representative for Common Grace and for Tear Australia. So if you want to find out how you can get involved in poverty movements, come and talk to me afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I'm finishing with four seconds to go. <laughs> <laughs> BCCT meeting, what is a key leadership learning you're experiencing in this season of rapid change? I want to credit Kirk Delaney for asking that question. Um, for me, I have to say the principle of what I call Saul's armour is what's helped me through all this. I was going through early on a whole lot of very critical self-comparison, saying all these other systems and churches and organisations are doing so much better than I am. And then I suddenly stopped and thought about it. David was offered the absolute state-of-the-art technology to combat Goliath, and he said, no thanks. I'll go with what I'm familiar with. And I took a step back from trying to embrace state-of-the-art technology and stuck to paper. Um, yeah. David effectively was asking, who is this really about? Why are you afraid? 
So for me, the key question in all of this has been why? Not who, how, what, where, or when. It was, it's why are we, why am I doing street chaplaincy? Why am I leading a church? What is church for? What is street chaplaincy for? That helped me to start leaning into learning to rest in God's presence, which ultimately as a leader, I need to do. If a family is going through stress and mum and dad are looking okay about it, the kids are going to be okay about it. In my role as a leader, I need to be okay about what's going on around me. Psalm 131. O oh Lord, my heart is not proud, my eyes are not haughty. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvellous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. I have cultivated a quiet heart, like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Transition from a screaming baby to a weaned, calm child is usually not a smooth one, mm. as most parents can attest. Uh, I'm a curious mix at the best of times. A theoretician, quite happy to be on his own, but a Mr. Fixer who always needs to get in there and, and sort things out when things are going wrong. Um, and so I am prone to forget that my identity is not in what I do, but it's in who I am and in whose I am. So, it's a both and question for me. Learning to rest in that dynamic tension of being in the now and the not yet. And it's just more exacerbated right now. And yet I get discouraged when I feel like I'm not doing anything or feeling anything or achieving anything. Mark 1. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and angels were ministering to him. This was before Jesus did anything. Jesus heard those words for my sake and for your sake. God is pleased with you before you do anything. And that is not contingent with how pleased you feel with yourself. That's a lesson I've had to keep learning. It strikes me here too that immediately the Holy Spirit thrusts Jesus out into the wilderness. It's the place where we're face to face with danger and promise. The wilderness is a place inhabited by demons and wild animals and disease and angels. My wilderness like yours, whatever form it takes for you, is a place full of simultaneous danger and promise. This is where the Lord chose to speak face to face to Moses. And we think we're going through something new. This was an open space with no clear boundaries. It was unfamiliar, it was precarious. It was all the predictable system and style of life was behind them, it's behind us. It was there the Lord began teaching his people Israel. And Moses reminds them in Deuteronomy the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness those 40 years to humble and test you, pushing you to your limits in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you'd keep his commands. The Lord thought it was worthwhile to spend 40 years on that lesson. He walks slowly the way we measure time. I get antsy if I have to wait 40 seconds for my computer to boot up. Our whole world has been thrust into a different kind of wilderness of unpredictability and of anxiety. But God walks slowly because he's love. If he was in a hurry, he could finish things quickly. But love has got its own speed. It's an inner spiritual speed. It's a different one to the technological speed that we are used to. But the speed we walk is the speed God chooses to walk because he's love. I have to remind myself of this often. We can't push time around, it pushes us along. Yet love is an objective reality that transcends time and he is more interested in my character than he is in my achievements. So during this season of change, I've been challenged to let go and let God change my character again. The lesson I'm learning is cultivating a quiet heart. Uh, I, I think for me during this time, um, 
just some things that, that I've observed from a church perspective is, is this. Um, for us uh, at Dream Builders Church, it was very much thrust upon us how, um, even though we intended not to be how much we were so Sunday centric, and uh, it just brought about in us, hey, this, this can't be, we know, and from our language it had been, it's not just about Sunday, as much as we love the gathering, it's not just about Sunday, but now we find ourselves in a place where it's not just about Sunday, and you're meeting, and you're meeting online, or however that is that, that, that you're gathering, and, and what we found was, and what it's really caused us to do, not so much um, know of the solutions, but to step into and really lean into the fact of, what are we doing to cultivate genuine fellowship? What are we doing to cultivate genuine community and we found that the people who grew the most in God during this time and who found the most peace was one in their relation their personal relationship with God but was also in the gen- those who had genuine fellowship with other believers and for us it was a very humbling experience because we found there was a whole large group of people who didn't have that genuine fellowship and uh, and so for us of course to, to look at that but also beyond that that's that's obviously with it from a discipleship point of view but also an extension of that discipleship is in terms of we're called as believers to, to transform our community, to engage in our community. And what are we doing during the week? What are we doing actually to, beyond just putting on events for the community, which we've done, beyond putting doing renovations and projects, which we've done in the past, we want to be able to engage and be with those who are in need and who are struggling. And what can we do not just to wait for a moment like this, but every day, as we heard before, there's people going through difficult things and struggling, and what are we doing to actually first hear and hear what the needs are, and not be quick to jump in and say, well, we think this is an answer for a need that doesn't need to be met. So asking ourselves a lot of these questions and really coming around and not wanting to just stop at a question, but to go beyond that. and so. What have we done within that? Instead of in the past, maybe just gathering a few people around and saying, let's brainstorm this and work it out and then let's execute it and get a whole heap of volunteers and make that happen. We're actually looking and saying, let's gather a whole heap of people from our church community who are already involved and engaged in the community and bring them together and hear what are the needs and all be a part of providing that solution. What are we doing from a from building genuine fellowship? Well, we're coming back and we're a part of something called a slow build. And for many of you that have been a part of that for a long time and who have given yourselves to that, you, you, you know that things don't happen fast when you really want to have that depth and that genuine fellowship and relationship and community. And beyond just community, because I felt like we had good community in certain parts, but it's got to be more than that. It's got to be fellowship. Christ has to be in the center of all of those conversations and needs to be in the center. It needs to be the discussion on the scriptures and what's God doing in you. It needs to be those who will come and ask that second question because they care enough about you to ask that second question and to go deeper into what's going on. The last thing that I could have observed in the 90 seconds that I have left is, is this. People have been asking a lot of questions at this time. And in the church, what a lot of people are asking and you may have heard it, you may not have, but a lot of people are asking this, what is the church? A lot of deconstruction of the church right now. There's a lot of mixing of justice, church, Bible, all things going on, critical thinking, so much stuff going on right now around that. I think it's a good thing that people are asking this question. But as I kept hearing it time and time again, well, we don't really know, you know, like we thought, you know, is it all about just a Sunday? No, it's an extension of that. We know it's a, more than that. But is it really about we are the church? And, we, and all these things are great. But I just cautioned someone the other day, and, and, and even within myself, and, and, and hear me, it's a good thing to ask this question. Everyone needs to ask this question. But we need to be coming back to, and I don't think anyone in this room thinks outside of this, but this has been for us, we need to be coming back to when we are reconstructing. Let's make sure we're reconstructing on what the Word of God says, what the church is. That we would be that and live that out. We wouldn't just become another movement, but we'd actually be what Christ died for and what he called us to be. And so we're in the very early stages of this journey. And so please, please pray for us. But we're excited about what, what God's doing. And he's really not just shown us, but really highlighted 
some of these things at this time. So uh, Barry's going to come and speak to us in a moment. You can let that run and it will automatically move over. Everyone stand up. Shake it out. Let your brain move down. Spot someone that you have you don't particularly know and give them the COVID wave, the COVID handshake. Good to see you. Give you those couple of moments. Okay. If you need to go to the toilet or grab a cup of fuel correctly, do it really quickly. You've got 20 seconds. So let's sit back down. Uh, Gareth's got that microphone. Oh, it's on the other side of the it's on the amp just there. It's just sort of hiding from you, Gary. Alright, grab a seat. We're about halfway through. Reminds me of waiting for the starters gun when you did streets of primary school. <laughs> Um, some of you may remember, uh, back in the 1930s, um, between the wars, uh, France built a massive defensive line uh, facing Germany called the Maginot Line, and they poured all of their money into that line to keep the Germans out of their country. And the line stopped at a place called the Ardennes because it was uh, too boggy, too hilly, too difficult for an army to get through quickly, so they thought. When the Germans attacked, what did they do? They pushed straight through the Ardennes, came round the back, and not a shot was fired from the Marginal line. They poured all their resources into what became an instant white elephant. In conventional Western churches, we, for decades, have poured all of our resources into facilities and programs, assuming that they would be the way in which we could impact our community most effectively. What did COVID do? It shut down all of our facilities and our programs. And suddenly we were facing out into a paddock where there was nobody to minister to. We could no longer do it. And that really got me thinking. Um, because I think we can expect ongoing disruptors. Um, this COVID is not, is maybe the first one in our generation, but it certainly won't be the last one. We know at least there is going to be severe economic disruption on the horizon when all the government money starts to run out. It could be second wave, there could be who knows what coming. And so started to, to rethink the forms in which we are doing church. Um, what we do is maybe appropriate for modern Western culture, but it hasn't been what churches have done in other places or in other times. There are many different ways in which church communities interact with their wider community. Um, what was interesting is that during the lockdown, there, were one, there was one thing that was sustained, and that was people's personal networks. They maintained connection with family, they maintained connection with friends and neighbours, they maintained connection with work if that were possible. People prioritised that, gave effort and energy to that. And we as churches would have to pull them out of that to get them to put energy and effort into something that we were doing. And so the thinking is, okay, maybe we as church should be pushing our effort and energy through the things that people are going to sustain naturally and automatically, rather than trying to pull them away uh, to do something, um, which in the end is going to be ineffective. I think the challenge for us is to move towards forms that are more flexible, more responsive. Um, organic is the uh, phrase you'll hear, the organic church movement. Now, nothing is perfect. Every form has its own weaknesses um, and dangers. And so it's not a, a good versus bad as we look forward. It's looking at what is different, what more suits the social, the economic and the spiritual circumstances we are going into. Um, so I sat down and uh, listed off a whole stack of descriptors of the old, the conventional way and the new way. And I've shoved them on a bit of paper. I'll put it up the back there for you to have a grab if you want to on the way out. Um, 
but lots of simple things instead of being focused through program and facility, focusing through personal networks. Um, in the conventional system, the major cost is money. The, ma the major resource is money. Uh, in a network system, the major cost is time. And there's lots of other things we just need to look at and start to prayerfully find the way in which we can refocus, reform how we do church so that we can connect with a community that's afraid, that's anxious, that's going to be broken up by the many disruptors that are going to come again in the future. Kingsley, I'm the uh, youth pastor at Dream Builders Mumbry, just near the farmer's market there, if you ever get lost. Um, but real quickly, I've got five minutes, um, I'm going to start off with, with just some context, then some observation, then conclude with how I've tried to implement and apply that. Um, so firstly, context, so at Dream Builders Mumbry we run a youth ministry called Sixo and Mostly, we've pretty much done the same thing as what um, Dale and Gary were touching on, where we just put a lot of our emphasis into the one day, and that for us was the Friday night uh, youth service, which they're great, we have preaching, we have a band and all that sort of stuff, but when you try and uh, facilitate discipleship, genuine community, everything else, all in that one night, it gets a bit much. And you have teams training during the week, you have all this admin happening, you have expenses, you have food, it's it's a lot of work and then I always had the expectation for the leaders to then disciple outside of that but reality was probably maybe two or one leaders were actually following up young people and hanging out outside of the Friday night and our motto has always been the Great Commission, Matthew 28, which is to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations and we're trying to again facilitate all that on the, the one night and it wasn't really being effective. And we always were asking ourselves the question, but until coronavirus happened, we we're forced to stop and ask ourselves the question again, like Paul was saying. So I thought that was that was quite interesting. So we had about two weeks, two to three weeks, where we couldn't really see anyone or actually minister to our young people effectively as we usually would, because we couldn't even meet. And then as soon as the uh, restrictions lifted to about five or ten. We could, so I got all the leaders. So we have a couple of young adults, maybe 12 young adult leaders each leading a different year group. So I got them to hang out with their young people and do a Bible study. And um, as long as they were doing a Bible study and praying, whatever they did was all good. So if they were going camping or just hanging out, having dinner, that's great. And what we found is in that time, because it was a genuine community happening, it was just with their age group, their gender, young people were coming more often and we were reaching far more young people than we ever had before. One of the nights we'll reach about 62 people and that we're lucky to do that in a year, you know, in one of our services. So that to me was, was awesome. So going forward, what we've tried to implement, instead of doing the Friday night service uh, every Friday, we've tried to do it less frequently, so once every month sort of thing. So that way, there's a bit more balance of preaching and corporate worship and uh, discipleship. So, yeah, that's what we've tried to do. And uh, we're just seeing what will happen. And the great thing with that is because um, preaching, services, worship, that all takes a lot of time, but now it's less frequent, so we're able to put more of a balanced approach and effort into those nights instead of running a mediocre night. It's actually it's good, the message is better, it's more on the words, focus, and we actually are able to follow up with our young people in the small group times on the Fridays and talk and discuss and pull apart the message and the word far more effectively than we ever had before. And in that, making disciples and being a bit more effective at that. So that's just pretty roughly what we've tried to do. Um, so we're just seeing how that works and yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> the question is, Jamie, do you get to steal his minute? Yeah. <laughs>
Now, it got, it got kicked along, I'm sorry. I was hoping for you. I prayed for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a gift of grace to you. Undeserved. It's, it's, on the, it's on the glass just there. So uh, Ryan asked me to speak about spiritual warfare. I tried. I really did, but it's impossible to summarize spiritual warfare in five minutes. So I was praying and saying, Lord, what am I going to do? And I just felt the Lord say, show them. So we're going to pray. Okay, that's what we're going to do. We're actually going to do it. First of all, a couple of observations. This is spiritual warfare. This is an answer to two years of prayer that I've been part of, building network relationships. Well done, everyone. The Roman shield wall is a great metaphor for the church aligned in prayer. Um, if you want to hear about the armor of God, I'm teaching a series in church. It's the next. It's on the, the website. Listen to it. But we're going to pray. We're on off from Ephesians, but really we're praying the whole of Ephesians. And we're going to pray together now. Okay? You up for that? Mm-hmm. Okay, so Holy Spirit, we just thank you you're here. And we ask you to guide us now. Mm-hmm. Father, we give thanks and praise that we are standing together as churches across this region. And that by your Holy Spirit, you're uniting us, uh, sharing and praying for one another and witnessing to the glorious truths that are found in Christ Jesus, the salvation that he has won for us. And we put on that helmet of salvation right now. Lord, we pray that our leaders um, across the diocese, across the different denominations would be protected. We pray, Father, for our thinking individually and corporately, Lord God, that it would align to your truth aligned to the way of Jesus, it aligned to a perspective that's in the heavenly realms, established peacefully, seated in Christ. Mm-hmm. Lord, we ask that you would enable us to take the authority you've given us and to begin to press your victory increasingly in this region, Lord. Mm-hmm. We thank and praise you that in Christ Jesus we have everything we need. Lord, that your spirit is enabling us as your children to walk it out uh, an increasing measure, Lord God, as we keep our eyes fixed on you. So, Lord, we put on that helmet of salvation with gladness. Father, we thank you for the breastplate of righteousness. Lord, that it's your righteousness. The armor is your armor, not our own. Father, we take off the armor that we've put on that's false armor. We put off the old ways. And we pray as churches, as an individuals, we be putting off the old self and clothing ourselves in Christ, led by your Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the righteousness you give us in Christ Jesus, the sacrifice that makes this possible, and that you crush the serpent's serpent's head uh, at the cross. Lord God, we thank you for your truth, and we want to wear it and the freedom it brings. Lord, we want to learn what it is to understand your word, both written word and your spoken word through the Spirit. Lord, we want to be a people of the book and a people of the Spirit. Lord, we pray as churches across this region that you'd breathe your spirit into the word and the word would become alive to us, living and active, sharper than any sword, dividing soul and marrow right down to the soul, that we would align to your truth as churches, as individuals, and therefore press your victory. Lord, that our feet would be clothed with the good news of Jesus because we're experiencing the good news. We're living in the good news and we have good news to share that we're poised and balanced in peace because we're living in that relationship with you. And Father, we take up the shield of faith. We thank you, Lord God, that the faith we have is in your faithfulness. That's where our faith is placed. And we lock shields in prayer with our brothers and sisters across the region. And we pray, Lord, that you would be acknowledged as Lord and Savior. And lastly, we take up your word, Lord, your sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Rima word, the living and active words spoken and breathed in by your Spirit. Lord, as we take our Bible studies, as we do our devotions, as we seek your face, Lord, may we be churches alive to God, alive to your word, and accurately use it, striking against every lie, every deception of the enemy, that we might see him thoroughly set back. As we resist him, he will flee from us, and your kingdom will come, and your will be done in this region. In Jesus' name.
Yeah, it's time for me to taste my own medicine, hey? <laughs> uh, gee, how helpful has this all been? Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to do some thanks a little bit later on as well. Uh, let me just share a, a couple of thoughts that I have around um, what's going to distinguish the churches in this next season. Uh, there's going to be some churches that die, that take a nosedive, that face plant, that end up on, I don't know if there's a failed TV version of churches, but they'll be on that. <laughs> there's going to be some churches that survive. They just hold on, circle the wagons, Jesus is coming soon, I'm going to make it eventually. White knuckle it to the end. And there's going to be some churches that thrive, that find in this season opportunity to grow in ways that we never thought possible. And yet, because God works in his mysterious ways, they're going to explode. And I think there's going to be churches in each category, and maybe parts of churches in each category, maybe parts of your churches in each category, in our Bunbury area. Here's what I see, um, and I am sure you'll add some things and maybe try and take away some things. Here's what I see about churches that will dive, and I don't just mean numerically. I mean emotional health. I mean the church is just going through a hard season and it just doesn't make it. It dives. It face plants. Uh, here's, I think, a marker of churches that will dive. They'll try to do it all. I think churches that try to do it all in this next season are going to face plant hard. It's going to be that CrossFit fail where they've tried to lift way too much weight <laughs> and it just doesn't work for the middle. Churches have been trying to do it all for a long time. Are you going to be a part of our men's ministry, our women's ministry, our young adult ministry, our youth ministry, our children's ministry, our outreach ministry? We'll add ministry on the end of anything. We're trying to do it all. Um, there was a pastor, Craig Rochelle, he did a, a talk a number of years back about a, a laser focus that churches need. And he had a pastor come up to him and say, we've got 513 ministries in our church. And he said, is that a prayer request or a boast? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you're in trouble. And I think there's churches in that area that are going to take a dive because they're trying to do it all. Another thing that I, I, I can see is some churches are going to try and do it alone. So some churches are going to dive. They're going to fail because they're trying to do it all. Other churches are going to dive because they're trying to do it alone. Now, not you. You're, you're clearly a very capable pastor and leader, and you guys got it all sorted. Sure, your church will be an exception to the rule. Uh, I think that God never intended for his family, his body, to be disjointed. Some churches are going to do a dive, and maybe you've got some things that you'll notice and add to that list. Those are two that I wanted to highlight. Uh, some churches that will only just survive, white knuckle it and hold on. They will just maintain what they have done. Now, thank you so much, Dale and Kingsley, with some of your reflections around that. Just trying to widen up, let make it through, keep doing what you've been doing. I don't know whether that's really going to advance. You may not decrease, but you will not increase. Another marker of churches that will just survive, maintain the way, the way they have done things. Not being creative. God's a creative God. He didn't need to make sunsets so beautiful. He didn't need to make us all so different. Did I say weird? No, different. Yes. <laughs> he created creatively. The churches that just survive, just hold on, they're just going to keep doing things the way they've always done. What about the churches that will thrive in the 59 seconds I have remaining? They're going to share ministries. I love in this church, uh, in this area, we've got groups that work together, work together in prayer, work together in youth, work together. They're the churches that are going to thrive. I believe God will bless that kind of unity. Churches that will share resources. You want to use our building? Go for it. You want to borrow our drama? Do it. You want to help one another? Those churches are going to thrive because God, I think, will bless them. Churches that share a vision. Now, it may not be that you use the same words. You might not have worship, follow, serve, tell on your walls, but you'll have your own version of Jesus be glorified in Bunbury. Jesus be magnified in this place. May the gospel advance. There'd be a shared vision. The churches that thrive will be the ones that share burdens. Thank you so much, Danielle, for sharing some of that. 
and more broadly amongst churches. Hey, you're struggling? How can we help? All right, final one. Uh, the churches that have a seasonal approach. It's not about what we have done. It's about what God is calling us to do in the next season. The churches that can be radically seasonal are the churches that are going to thrive. What is God calling us specifically to do as this church in this season to meet this need for the gospel and the kingdom to advance? I think that's what's going to happen. Okay, so what we're going to do now is there's going to be, I'm not sure how many minutes I've got preset, two minutes of silence. And we're just going to sit in all that we've just heard and thought about and then we're going to move into group discussion. So let's just pause and take a couple of minutes to sit and reflect. We thank you, you come in a still small voice. Speak, for your servants have been listening. Now's an opportunity, now you can open your eyes, to chat with those who are on your table. Share your notes. Not just who did you appreciate most. Keep socially distant, but you've got 10 minutes, and chat with those on your table. What did you learn? What did God tell you? And then after those 10 minutes, because everyone spoke so much on time, it was brilliant, well done, thank you. Uh, we'll be able to canvas a little bit of anything that came up collectively. So, 10 minutes, chat with those around your tables. <laughs>
Sometimes you put on the agenda certain things to be done and, and to some degree the purpose of tonight was to discuss our reflections on COVID and aware that you know there's every chance we'll go through a second and third or fourth wave or whatever. Um, but kind of the hope is bigger than that, is that we instill a, a, an experience, honest discussions between churches and church leaders around how we can grow and shape and become more like Christ. Um, and if any of that's happened tonight, if you were really interested by someone who spoke and, oh, I'd love to hear more from that, and you end up flicking them an email and a conversation occurs and something snowballs out of that, praise God, right? And was there anything that just popped up? As we've got, I'll give us two or three minutes of just canvassing the room. Was there anything that you go, hey, did you notice that that word was used four times between different people? Or I just really wanted to share this. Speak now, forever hold your peace. Shout it out. Go for it. I'm going to say thank you for a rich time. It's been really rich. Thank you. I think a general recognition of the need for new wineskins. New wineskins. Use a biblical. Yeah. New wineskins. Yeah. What we hear, we have to start from ourselves. And it goes out into the body of the church, and then from the body of the church, it goes into the world. Mm -hmm. 
but they, they can't do that unless we are yeah. united yeah. in Christ. Yeah. Mm. And everything else is pushed aside, and all I want to do is serve the Lord. Mm. And as I said to some, as you know, um, I am a Christian first. I'm a denomination second. Mm. And mm. I think when, when we get to that, and we're worshipping God, I'm sorry, I'm going to No, it's good. No, thank you, Darren. Thank you. Thank you. It's good. No, you did well, Derek. You did well. You did good. Praise God for your comments. Yes. You know that we stand the body before. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about here that it was great to hear people's honest reflections. So thank you, everyone, for that. But, um, yeah, you're open about how things have been going and it's been tough for all of us. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, uh, what we're going to do to, to close our time together now is uh, we're just going to thank each of our speakers one by one, and uh, we're going to do, Jamie, I, I might be copying you a little bit here, but we're, we're going to just extend our arm out towards the person that spoke, and we're just going to say this line, bless you in all your ministries, bless you in all that you do, okay? So let's go through uh, one by one. First, we, we have Paul. Thank you so much for speaking on the power of the second question. I bless you in all that you do. Uh, next, uh, we had Ross. Thank you so much for bringing all that you did. Bless you in all that you do. Uh, David, uh, thank you for being flexible and moving around when you did and for keeping the time. Uh, bless you in all that you do. Uh, Danielle, thank you so much for bringing your insights and your perspectives. Uh, bless you in all that you do. Uh, Tim, Thank you for your, your stillness and your quietness. And you even had swelling music up behind you as you finished the major final. It was very vineyard. It was great. Bless you in all that you do. Dale, thank you for your honesty and thank you for your passion in speaking. Bless you in all that you do. Garrick, thank you for being flexible and allowing uh, and doing the work behind the desk there. Bless you in all that you do. Kingsley. Uh, thank you for the incredible moustache. Uh, thank you for your reflections. Thank you for bringing the median age down in this room. We appreciate it. And thank you for your observations. Man, we really appreciate it. Bless you in all that you do. Jamie, thank you so much for praying, uh, for giving us some insight on that. We will chase you up if that's, uh, I think, something that we're, we're hungering for is uh, working together in the body of Christ. So bless you in all that you do. And thank you uh, so much for being here with us today. Would you just bow your heads and we're just going to pray to close in this time. Can we bless you? Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Can we pray together? Thank you. Our oh, Lord and our God, we just thank you so much that we're brothers and sisters. At the end of the day, uh, whether we're uh, the first kid that ran away and ended up in the mud and the mire, whether we're the second kid who thought we've done pretty well with our life and we're a bit upset at the prodigal sons returned and received, but we're being invited into the party. But we're just brothers and sisters now. There's a feast going on. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in the name of Jesus, our King, our Lord, our Saviour and our Christ. And Lord, for the 50,000 plus people in our area who don't know you, the harvest is ripe, the labourers are few. Release us and the people in our churches to be labourers in that harvest. God, we praise you for the unity we experience tonight, the honesty, the insights. May we be constantly teachable as churches, mouldable, to be shaped by you. And so may we grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Now, if you did grab a coffee and you wanted one before you go because you feel like being up till midnight, please do. <laughs> uh, otherwise, do say hello.